many people know what a meteorologist actually is? All right, good. So you know it has to do with the weather. Do you know any jobs that we do? What? You shout it out. What, what jobs do meteorologists do? <laughs> well, study the universe, that's astronomy, but no, we, we, um, we study science a lot, of course. Um, most of what we do is surrounding about the weather that's happening right now. So you see a lot of people on TV that are presenting the weather. They have the green screen behind them. They're talking about the radar behind them, if there's rain coming, if the temperatures are hot or cold. There's also people that go and do the research on how to make the models to actually make that happen, to make the satellites go into the orbit around the Earth so that they could present the weather to us, tell us exactly what's happening around the world. There's people that go and look into the past and see what happened if it snowed. Let's say you guys had a snowstorm back in March, right? They could go and see exactly how much snow fell in that certain amount of time and see what impact that had on you guys as well. So... As you know, you're heading now into December, you know, it's December 7th right now, and we're going into winter, and that's only in two weeks, so it's going to be getting a lot colder out, um, but in Texas, it's not going to get too cold. You guys are still going to be in the 60s, 70s, so you're not going to be seeing snow just yet, but um, there are little places um, just north of you in Oklahoma, Nebraska, that have seen snow, so... Um, one question that I want to ask you guys is, and what you guys want to figure out is, why does it snow when it's winter? Why is it cold when it's winter? What creates winter? Um, and then flip side, um, if you go into summer, why is it summer? Why is it so warm? Um, so I want to show you guys, you, you want to learn about cycles today um, and why we have a lot of cycles around the, you know, the world, around the sun, around the solar system as well. A lot of that has to do with how we interact with different things. So, you know, we're on the earth right now. Um, you guys have heard of tides, right? Like high tide, uh, low tide with the oceans coming in. How it's, if, it, if it's high tide, the water is a little bit higher. If it's low tide, the water is a little bit lower, right? What actually causes that? So I want to show you guys. Let me switch over right now and share my screen. You guys know all about how the Earth and the moon interact, right? So, see, the moon's all the way up here. The Earth's over here. When the moon pulls on the water, it creates a little high tide. So, you guys know about gravity, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, the Earth and the moon, they're tugging at each other, right? Um, the moon is tugging on the Earth, but the Earth doesn't really budge that much because the Earth has its own gravity, but it is pulling at the water as well. And you can see here, it pulls all the water from the sides up to here. And over here would be a high tide. Over here would be a low tide because there's a lot less water. And over here is another high tide because the moon really hasn't pulled on it too much. It actually pulls the earth just a little bit, which creates a little bit more water. So that's one part of tides. But also, um, you can see as the moon goes around the earth and the earth spins, so you say we're right here, right? Here's the U.S. We're going around in a circle. We're now in the high tide. Now we're in the low tide. We're in the high tide. We're in the low tide. So as the Earth spins around and creates its motion, which is rotation, it rotates around these little tidal bulges. So it rotates into the high tide. It rotates into the low tide, and so on and so on. So the moon pulls on the Earth, and that's what creates tides. As far as seasons go, it's very similar, however... You can see here, the sun is in the center. First planet is what? Mercury. Second is? Venus. Third is? Earth. And the fourth is? Mars. Good job. So you see here, the Earth is rotating, uh, sorry, is revolving around the sun. And the reason why we have different seasons, when you, when you have different seasons, all it means is that the Earth is rotating around the sun at a different way. So you can see here in one, di well, one little diagram, we right now we're heading into winter, which means that up on north, we're in the northern hemisphere, right? We're north of the equator. When we're heading into the, to December, so December 22nd, that's the winter solstice, that's in two weeks, the sun is heating up the very south part of the world a lot more than they're heating up the north part of the earth. And because we're getting a lot less heat, it's going to be colder, right? Which means that we're going to be heading into lower temperatures, and that's winter. If you go to summer, it's the exact opposite. The, there's a lot more sun that's happening on the northern hemisphere where we are. So, you guys know where Australia is located? Yeah. So, right, so, so, Australia is on the very south side 
of the equator. So the equator's here. So let's say that this is the Earth, right? It goes around in a circle. The Earth is like this. We're on the northern part over here. Australia's on the southern part here. So when it's cold here, it's summer over there. When it's summer for us, it's winter there. That's because the, um, the Earth is a little bit tilted, right? So the top of the Earth is going to be heated a lot more in the summer and a lot less in winter. But because you're on the south side, it's going to get a lot warmer. And it's pretty much even for, for uh, when we go into spring versus, uh, spring versus um, fall. So, um, and just to show you guys another diagram, there's a really good one here of showing you guys um, exactly what happens when, uh, when we have summer versus winter. So you can see here, look at these arrows, right? There's, a, there's one, two, three arrows pointing towards the north, right? So there's only three little bits of heat. But if you go towards the equator here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, six arrows. So just to show you again, heading into winter, the south side, so South America, is getting a lot more rays of sunshine, meaning that they're going to be a lot warmer than the northern part of the hemisphere where we are in North America, which are only getting a, little, a lot less sunshine. And going into here... This is, uh, this is summer now. You see here, one, two, three, four, five, six arrows. So it's warmer in summer. And only one, two, three on the very south side of the earth. And that's winter. So that's summer versus winter. Now, as far as how this affects us, I'm going to show you guys right now. This is how the earth looks to us right now. We're over here. If you zoom all the way in, you guys are right over here. This is Texas. Alice. You can see all Texas here, and then you zoom out more. This is northern. This is North America, South America, Australia is all the way over here, and then you have the rest of the. You have Africa, Europe, and Asia as well. And basically, what happens here, you can see there's really nothing around you right now. So there is a lot of high pressure. You guys, have you guys learned about any, anything with weather yet? Yes. All right, name some of the things that you've learned so far as far as what you're looking on right now with the radar. <coughs> so what, what is this green stuff over here? Green. Yep. And then what is, the, what is the blue stuff over here? Water. Almost. It's cold Snow. rain. What happens when rain is cold? It falls as? Snow. Snow. Yeah. There you go. Wow. And then all this white, what are these? Clouds. clouds exactly so you see here there's nothing over you guys right now if you look out the window there's no rain there's no clouds in the sky there's nothing to worry about um but if you had let's say these systems coming through and if i press play here you're gonna see here actually let me remove the cloud so it's a little bit smoother for you guys you can see just how the rain moves as it goes across the earth so you see here the rain is going from left to right right it goes from left to right if you go anywhere else, let's say that I go to Europe, it's going from where? Left to right. It's always going east. Now, why is that? Why does weather always go from left to right? It's because the earth is spinning, right? So I, you saw in that, um, in the other diagram with the, where are you? You saw in the other diagram that we had um, the tides rotating around the moon, right? So... You have the Earth revolving around the sun, which creates the seasons, and you have the Earth that is rotating around. When it rotates, the systems are also moving along with it. So the systems are moving with the winds that are pushing along the Earth because the Earth is always moving. So you're going to see, and this is something that I found just a month ago um, that is amazing. It shows everything that's happening in the entire earth as you go into the into the air you can see here this is a jet stream have you guys heard of the jet stream at all no. okay so how many of you have been in the airplanes before uh, i just went all right so have you heard when when you says oh this is your captain speaking we are now at cruising altitude have you heard that before cruising altitude yes. so that means that they're so high in the air that something called a jet stream is pushing them past. A jet stream, you know, we're, we're down here on Earth. It's only maybe 5, 10 miles per hour of wind outside. But if you go all the way up into the jet stream, it's over 100 miles per hour of wind. So when you go all the way up to there, then they go to cruising altitude. Their planes have to work a lot less because there's a lot of wind pushing them. So 
have you guys, when it's really windy out, have you ever tried running into the wind? You know how hard it is to run, right? But have you ever tried running with the wind pushing you behind? You know how faster you run and how much easier it is to run? Well, that's what happens with planes as well. The planes, um, planes are a lot faster because the wind is pushing right behind them. So that's, that's a big thing. Um, so um, as far as um, any weather that we know and why it's so important for us to know about why, you know, how to figure out if it's raining or not, how to figure out if there's a hurricane coming to you guys. I know it's not hurricane season anymore, but let's say that there was a hurricane right here in the Atlantic to figure out how the hurricane was moving towards us. If there was a hurricane that might, you know, how do we figure out if it's coming towards us or if it's moving towards, let's say Alabama instead and moving up here, or if there's a hurricane near Mexico, if it's going to come through Mexico and hit us, or if it's just going to go right through the Gulf and hit Florida instead. Um, it's very important for us to look at prior, um, prior things that have happened and use that in order to figure out exactly how, weather systems work, how hurricanes work, how tornadoes work. And from that, we could figure out with hurt, with hurricanes, exactly where the paths go with tornadoes. If how much time we have until our tornado hits, you know, only 20 years ago, it, if a tornado was outside, you maybe had three or four minutes before you could, you know, have the warning and find shelter. Now we're up to 18 minutes or 14 minutes, soon to be 18 minutes over the next couple of years. So it's very important for us to look at what happened in the past and use that to help us in the future. Here we have all the paths of hurricanes. So you are, you guys are right over here, right? You guys are right in this area. Now, how do we know that hurricanes come over here? Because we could look at all past data and know that there's been X amount of hurricanes that have come over to us and hit us before. Um, and actually, there's a nice little program where we could search for all the hurricanes that have hit you guys. And using that, we could see exactly where the paths are. So if I type in, um, what, what you're in McKinley, right? So that's near Dallas. McKinney. McKinney, McKinney. McKinney, okay. So if I search McKinney, you guys are right over here in this area. These are all the hurricanes that have come by you, come by you in, the in the past, uh, I believe, 150 years. There's been 67. So you can see here they follow a general path. They start over here and go through the Gulf and hit you guys, right? So knowing that, we could say that, okay, if a hurricane forms over here, it's not going to hit us. If a hurricane forms over here, it's probably not going to hit us either. But if it forms somewhere over here in the Gulf, it may have a good chance of hitting us. So this is a look at past data to figure out exactly where we get hit and how often we get hit and if it's going to be strong or not. Um, and it's a great tool for figuring that out. For tor tornadoes, they're just north of you guys. They don't hit too often, but we could also look and see exactly, you know, um, we could see exactly where they have been from, how they form, and and what pushes them to being made. So you can see here, like we know from data that tornadoes form when there's warm, cold, and dry air that come together, turn around, uh, create a cyclone, and create this this tornado. And you can see here, you guys you guys have played with pinwheels before, right? Yeah. So if you blow to a pinwheel, what happens? The the pin the pinwheel goes around in a circle like this, right? Now, imagine a pinwheel on the ground. There's a lot of wind turning it around in a circle, right? So it's turning around in a circle just like this. How, what is, how, how is the wind moving? The wind's moving with this as, as well, right? It's going around in a circle around that. Now, imagine there's enough wind to make that go fast enough that it goes up into the sky and rotates around the cloud that has a lot of energy in it with lightning and rain. And then all of a sudden it connects to the ground. That's a tornado. So we know that happens because we've seen tornadoes before. We know what ingredients goes into making a tornado. And you guys can make a tornado at home, actually. Um, have you ever seen the tornado bottle experiment where you take two bottles and you, you swish it around? So the tornado bottle experiment um, here, um, it looks exactly like this, right? Yes. So you could do this yourself. That is a tornado. That's exactly what happens. So if you swish it around, it turns around, goes faster and faster, and then it creates a tornado, and then the tornado comes out the other side with with all the air, right? Uh, with all the uh, the air on the other side. Now, 
the reason why that happens, there's low pressure. Um, have you, you guys know what low pressure is? So for, for the people who have been in, um, you guys been in airplanes, you know when it starts to take off and all of a sudden you hear your ears pop? Yeah. And you know how you also feel like your head's being squished a little bit? Yeah. That's because the pressure is getting lower and lower and lower. That's, that's the whole reason why that happens. And with a tornado, the pressure is low enough that all the air gets sucked into it as well. So that's what happens with low pressure. There's usually a lot of, and that you can see over here as well, right where this is, there's low pressure over here, which is why you're seeing a lot of rain and snow. Because low pressure means that there is a lot of um, energy that's coming in, but it's also getting... Um, moisture in the atmosphere and there's clouds and the low pressure creates a little cyclone or our cyclonic um, low pressure system and that creates a lot of rain and, and and possibly snow if it's cold but over you guys high pressure is the exact opposite high pressure means that things are getting spread out and high pressure means that there's no clouds that it's very hard for the clouds to form which means that there's no rain and it usually means that it's going to be great weather all around um, so what other things have you guys learned about that you want to learn more about? Have you guys learned about the, the water cycle at all? Yeah. All right. So, um, so you guys know about the water cycle. There's evaporation, which means that the water goes into the sky. There's condensation, which means that that water starts to form into clouds. Precipitation is rain, snow. That means that that rain falls down to the ground again. And collection means that it creates puddles, it adds itself to rivers or oceans or any water mass whatsoever, and then the cycle repeats. That water that's on the ground goes evaporates right back into the air. So that's the water cycle, and you can see it here a little bit more. So you can see here, the water is in a lake over here. It evaporates into the sky, creates clouds, and then precipitates right back onto the ground. So that's the water cycle. It's very simple. Um, and you guys know the difference between liquid okay so what is frozen water just shout it out exactly and what is water that has uh that is evaporated that is boiled off vapor gas. yep vapor gas and that's also clouds as well so when liquid goes into an ice it it uh freezes into ice right when ice goes back into water it melts back into water when water goes into the air, it evaporates into water vapor, turns into clouds. And when the clouds turn back into rain, it condensates back into liquid. And then that liquid gets so heavy that it falls to the earth as rain. So that's the water cycle. It's very simple. Um, and as far as anything else goes, um, have, do you guys, have you, any of you guys ever seen, I'll show you this right here. You guys should shout it out if you've seen this before. Have you guys seen this before? Yeah. So these are hailstones. Um, you know, that, all that means is that the, the rain that has been in the, in the sky, instead of it coming back to the ground, there's winds that push it right back up into the air. It freezes again and falls down as, as hail. That's all it is. So um, if you're outside, and you can do this experiment yourself as well, um, say that you have some, a book on the table, right? Or let's, say, let's actually say this. You have a ruler that's hanging off a table, right? It, and you have it there and it's staying still. What happens? You put a paper clip on the end. Nothing really happens, right? That means that that's, you could say that the clouds. There's maybe only a little bit of, of water that's in the cloud. It's not ready to fall yet. But the more paper clips you put on that end of the ruler, eventually what happens? The ruler falls off, right? That's rain. That's so much liquid in the cloud that the cloud can't hold it anymore. Just like the paper clips, the ruler falls off. The same thing with clouds happen. There's so much rain in it that the rain falls down. That's all it is. But with hail, if there's enough wind pushing it back up to go against gravity, that goes back into the, the sky where it's colder. It's a lot colder as you go up higher in the sky. Um, and it, that ice refreezes into hail. Um, it's the reason why you guys have seen mountains, right? Have you seen mountains in Colorado? How it's you know green on the ground, but as you go higher into the mountain, it's white with snow. That means... That's because when you go higher in the atmosphere, when you go higher in the sky, it is a lot colder. As you go up higher, it's colder. So, and clouds that you see in the sky, they're actually a lot colder because of the fact that they're in colder temperatures. Um, 
So that's that. Um, there's also, let me show you guys here. Um, there's also a lot of different types of clouds that you, that you have. Um, and I want to show you guys a couple of cool ones. So first off, the clouds that, that make snow, right? There's actually a lot of different types of snowflakes. So the ones that you'll normally see when it's near 32 degrees outside, that'll look like this. So there are plates that look like flat snowflakes. They're, they're always six sides no matter what. But you can see here there are snowflakes that are six sides that are plates. If you get colder, though, they turn into little needles or columns. They go turn back into large plates as you get even colder, and then back into cylinders if you get really cold. Um, so that's, that's different types of snow. And as you get colder, there's actually more snow that forms because um, what happens when you put water in a cup and you put it in the freezer? It expands, right? Um, when water gets colder, it expands. So it makes sense that when snow falls, the colder the snow is, the bigger the snowflakes. So if you guys ever see snow this winter and it's very cold out, um, let's say that it goes down to 10 degrees. Those snowflakes will be a lot bigger than it were than if it was 32 degrees, which is where, where uh, rain turns into snow instead. Um, now, here are a couple of different types of clouds. This, this looks like an anvil, right? This is the cloud that creates thunderstorms or severe thunderstorms, torn possible tornadoes, hail. This is a gigantic cloud that goes up five miles into the sky. It's a very large cloud, and it creates a lot of thunderstorms and very heavy rain. This is a fire rainbow. So these are actually clouds. Um, they're reflecting the sun. And um, have you guys seen prisms before? Have you guys worked with prisms at all? Yes, I have. Okay, so a prism is this. A prism splits up light from white. So what we're seeing outside right now from the sun and everything else, it's white light. But if you take a prism, it splits it up into all the colors of the rainbow. And what happens with the fire rainbow is the, um, the light is being split up at just a specific angle um, and goes off the clouds, and it looks like it's a fire cloud of, of rainbow. But this is a cloud. There's nothing else that's happening other than this just being a cloud. Um, there's also clouds that look like UFOs. This is called a lenticular cloud. It looks like a UFO. Usually they form up, um, along mountains, and you can see, sometimes you can see a UFO on top of a UFO uh, in different layers. And then there's also this. These are clouds, but it looks like ocean waves, right? So there's, there's a lot of different types of, ocean, of, of clouds. But going back to what I showed you before with a pinwheel and, um, and talking about tornadoes, so when a tornado goes around in a circle, right, um, it could also pick up things. So when you see a tornado, you see videos of a tornado, it's usually the only way that you could see it is because it's picking up the ground, it's picking up dirt, it's picking up any debris, it's picking up maybe pieces of, of the road that it's picking up. Um, but it could also pick up other things. And um, if it picks up, if it's over the, the water, it picks up the water itself. So you can see here, this is a water spout. It's just a tornado over water. It's just picking up the water and bringing it up into the cloud. But something else, it could also pick up fire. And this is a tornado that's over fire right now. So, so that's, a, that's a fire tornado. Um, but the most important thing is realize, is figuring out how this works. So near you guys right now, um, let me show you guys here. You guys have heard of Tornado Alley, right? Yes. Technically, you guys are in Tornado Alley. Now, the reason why there's so many tornadoes is because we know that there's that jet stream before that I was talking about where there's high winds in the upper atmosphere that are pushing along at over 100 miles per hour. There's cold air coming off of the Rocky Mountains. There's warm air that is dry that's coming off of Mexico, and there's warm, moist air, the wet air that's coming off of, um, coming off of the Gulf. And when those all mix together and rotate, they create tornadoes. Um, and we know that looking at past data, um, exactly what the conditions are that create tornadoes. And it's very important for us to look at that because then we could say, we could predict, okay, well, today we have a very high tornado warning because we're seeing all these conditions that are very similar to what we've seen in the past with other systems that have created these tornadoes. So looking at data that has happened in the past helps us a lot with figuring out exactly what happened. Um, did you guys have any other questions that you guys came with that you have on your own that you guys want to talk about? 
What causes evaporation to start? Um, so evaporation, when water, let's say that this cup of water, right? It's on the ground. Evaporation happens when this water becomes hot enough and it has, a lot, has enough energy to um, turn into water vapor. So remember that, um, here, let me show the rain cycle here. So you can see here, this, this is water on the ground, right? When there's enough heat in this liquid. So say that you, um, have you guys ever seen a pot of water boil before? Yeah. So what happens with that is the water is getting hot enough that it turns, it evaporates and turns into vapor. So it absorbs enough heat that it is no longer able to be a liquid and all of a sudden um, gets hot enough that it phase changes into being a vapor. Um, this happens outside, even though it's not that hot outside, evaporation can also happen when it's very cold outside. But when the, when the sun, um, when it's sunny outside, the sun comes down and have you ever felt, you when you feel the sun on your face, it, you feel a lot warmer, right? Um, that because you're, let's say that you feel it on your forehead, your head is, is absorbing the energy from the sun. The wavelengths that are coming from the sunlight are hitting your head and you're absorbing some of it, which means that your head is getting a little bit warmer. When that happens with water, the water is, um, the sunlight is hitting the water and that water is absorbing some of that energy and that heat. And if it absorbs enough of it, layer by layer, just a little bit by little bit, even the top layer gets just hot enough that it evaporates just a little bit. So evaporation, let's say that I saw this and I, and I took a picture of this now and it was outside. If I took a picture of this two hours later in the sunlight, it would be a lot lower. So it would be as if I was doing this and drinking it. It's a little bit lower. Evaporation happens on water very, very, very slowly. So a very, very small amount at a time because there's only so much um, heat that sunlight could, um, could go into the water and be absorbed. But it happens a little bit by little bit because that very, very top surface is getting absorbed with the heat and it gets just hot enough that it turns into water vapor and goes into the sky. And if enough of that happens, they turn into clouds as well because it's getting colder in the atmosphere. And when that water vapor cools down, it turns back into liquid. So that's, that's evaporation. How does it rain and the sun shine at the same time? Good question. So um, I could show you guys actually right here. Um, you can see there's a lot of rain. And if I put this, the clouds over here, there's a lot of clouds. But if I go to somewhere like here, you can see here there's a couple of spots, of little breaks in the clouds. So there are some times where you see the, let's say, isolated showers. So let me see here. This is actually a perfect image. Um, this is what you're talking about right, with isolated showers. You can see the sun everywhere else. The reason why it happens is Rain can only fall down, or if there's wind, it falls at a little bit of an angle, right? But you can see here, the rain is going from here to here. So I'm, I'm highlighting this in red right now. The rain is going from here to here, and that's all that happens. But sunlight could come in from the side here. So sunlight, let me make this yellow instead. Sunlight can go from here to here. It could go from the side, and you can see the sun off all the way in the distance because it could go at any angle it also so sunlight also bounces off the ground a little bit um so that's how you can see sunlight but also you can see here there's a little break in sun over here where the, where this cloud isn't so it's called a sun shower because there's only a certain amount of clouds that are actually making the rain but maybe just to the right of you or just to the left of you there's no clouds around there um so the clouds are the things that cause rain. But if there's only enough clouds to cause just a little amount of rain, and those are the only clouds in the area, then you could see sun all around you because there's enough breaks in them. Um, so the sun, and also the sun could come through just a little bit, or the sun could come through little breaks in the clouds. So you could see right over here, actually, in this little area over here, there's a little bit of a break. So there's actually a little bit of sun coming down here as well. But that's a little bit closer to you as well. But if you're in the middle of the rain, there's going to be rain all around you. You could still see the sun a little bit farther off into the distance because there's maybe no clouds over there. Um, it happens a little bit less often, but that's how you could see sunshine even though it's raining outside. And you can see here there's sun coming on this side as well. 
How does the sun get its heat? Good question. So, um, the sun, here, let me show you guys a sun cross section. So, the same goes with the earth. The earth is very, it has a molten core. It's very hot in the inside and it gets colder and colder as you go outside. So, you guys know what lava is, right? With volcanoes? That's yeah. because. So lava comes from a lot closer to the center of the earth. It's very hot and it goes all the way up and then comes out through the volcano. That lava has come closer towards the center of the earth because it's very, very hot. The sun in the very center is made of hydrogen and helium. Two very, um, very, I think it's, um, they, uh, they, are no, they are noble gases. They're the, they're the original two. So helium is, has two... Um, it's, it's, I'm blanking right. It has two electrons, right? Two protons. Um, and hydrogen is the original one. Uh, so um, hydrogen has one proton, one electron. Um, what happens is in the center of the sun, those atoms, the hydrogen and the helium mostly, they start, they start getting faster. It's really, really hot inside of it because there's so much gravity. And um, have you ever, you ever guys went like this before? Rub your hands together? What is that? That's friction, right? Um, now imagine atoms, very tiny atoms that are doing that as well. They're bumping into each other at a very fast speed. Each time they bump together, they get hotter and hotter because there's a lot of friction as they bounce off. Inside the sun, there is a lot of atoms. There's a lot of hydrogen and helium, and they get hotter and hotter and hotter as they go along, um, and they start combining into bigger and bigger elements. So you have hydrogen, then you have helium, then you have sodium, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, all the other atom, all the other types of elements. Um, when those form into bigger elements, they also emit a lot of energy as well. Um, and as those um, as those atoms really bounce around a lot more, they create a lot more heat and have a lot more nuclear. They're called nuclear forces. Um, the more they bounce outside. The, the bigger the sun tries to get, but also the gra there's a lot of gravity in the sun because there's a lot of mass in there. So the gravity is pushing back up against it. And that constant push and pull um, means that over millions and billions of years, the sun gets hotter and hotter inside the center because of the fact that all those atoms are constantly pushing up against each other and can't really escape. Um, so the sun gets very hot because of the fact that the core, there's so many different atoms in there that are bouncing up against each other and that get hotter and hotter and hotter. And eventually, they go outside towards the sun. Um, actually, uh, as you go into the center of the sun, whatever lights in the center takes a million years to get to the outside of the sun. And all the while, it's, it's getting hotter and hotter. And those gases get, um, they're over, I think they're four or 5,000 degrees Kelvin. Um, I actually forgot the, the, the exact temperature. Um, oh, yeah, there we go. Coronal high, 2 million degrees. So, in, sorry, it's, it's 40 to 50,000 degrees Kelvin in the center, and they get hotter and hotter as they go out. So it's actually 2 million degrees um, on the corona of the sun uh, because of the fact that all those gases that have heated up over the, the millions of years inside the sun, they finally get to the outside, and they're hot enough that um, they, they radiate out as very warm sunshine. How long does water spin in different places? How, how long do they spin? Yes. Spend. Spend. Oh, spend. Okay, so there's a couple of different answers to that. Um, do you guys know about um, the Gulf Stream or um, they're called conveyor belts in the ocean? They're different. Uh, here, let me, let me load this up for you guys. The Gulf Stream. And actually, you know what? I'm just going to look up ocean currents. So... As far as where they spend time, these are different ocean currents. Um, so water could stay over here, but if it's caught in a, like if, if we have water that's staying in the middle of the ocean, if it's inside the ocean, maybe there's a little bit of currents that are moving it. But you have here, this is a Gulf Stream, right? From here, let me make this back to red here. From here to here, actually I'll make this green so you guys can see this. So the Gulf Stream is right over here. Make this blue instead. It's a lot easier. Gulf Stream is here, right? So if you have water in the ocean and you're on the Gulf Stream, it'll move towards a certain area. Um, and if you're in the center where there's really not much happening, like here, the water really won't move too much. Um, but currents move ocean that are in water. If you're in the air, it's wind that moves 
Um, the clouds, which are basically just water, the clouds in the upper atmosphere, the wind moves those. And um, if you have lakes, the water could stay there, but um, on the very surface, the water could evaporate, like I said before, and turn into clouds and then move with the winds that are in the atmosphere. Um, so, and so water usually stays put only if it's within, let's say, um, oceans, uh, any land masses, rivers, it moves, of course, because rivers are constantly moving. You have lakes, which have the water staying in there. You have ice as well. So if you go to Antarctica, this is all ice, right? The water stays put because it's trapped in ice and it doesn't move unless it melts and starts to evaporate into the sky and moves across the earth as well. Um, so as long as it's trapped within ice, within a lake, within the ocean that doesn't have a current, within any seas, within um, this is the Mediterranean Sea or the Caspian Sea over here, um, as long as it stays in those, then it doesn't really move. But if there are currents, if it's, if it's able to be evaporated into the sky, then they move then. Um, so that's how water stays put or, or evaporates. And of course, water also gets sucked in towards the moon with the tides, as I showed you before. So the water gets, could get sucked towards the moon as well. But usually they stay in place a little bit more. Um, but yeah, it's basically currents and, and the atmosphere that moves around with evaporation and stays put in any, any ocean masses that's underneath the ocean or seas or, or uh, lakes. Very good. All right, uh, second grade, what do we tell Mr. Mayor? Thank you. No problem. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. We do appreciate your time. No problem. Oh, 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 oh,